Hello, everybody. Welcome to our Soulcast Media Live event. If everybody can see me and can hear me all right, give me a thumbs up on your end just so I know everything is working beautifully. It is so fantastic to see everybody. I was looking at the comments behind the scenes and how amazing is this? We have people from all over the world joining us right now, and what an honor it is. In fact, it's one of the beauties of doing these events. I mean, you really get to invite everybody to come. And I'm so excited about this because we have a great event in store for you. My friend Simone and I, we have so much to talk about in regards to communications and human connection and how all of us can think a little bit more strategically in terms of how do we show up in the workplace? How can we find those critical workplace relationships that can really unlock the most amazing of opportunities. So today's event is going to be about 45 minutes or so. I imagine there might be a few folks here who've attended my previous Soulcast Media Live event. So if this is your first time joining, welcome. If you've been here before, I'm so happy that you're back. I host these about every week, every other week or so, and it's always a fantastic guest and I talking about communication skills. So I want you to know, this event is, as much as it is a conversation between my guest and I, it's also a conversation for you. Meaning, if you have any questions for my guest and I, you have a chat function. It might be on the side or below, but it's for you. So if you have any questions for us, put it in there. We will get to it as best as we can because we want you to know that this event is for you. So before we get started, I'm going to just do a quick intro of who I am. For those who don't know, my name is Jessica Chen, and I'm the founder and CEO of Soulcast Media, and we are a communications training company. We work with Fortune 100 companies. I come in. I do a lot of speaking engagements and training trainings because my hope is to help people build those critical communication skills to eventually be able to think about visibility, advocating for yourself, and honestly, to just get the credit you deserve. So communications has been a passion of mine. Prior to Soulcast Media, I used to be on TV. So I used to be a former television news reporter here in the States, in the U.S., at ABC, NBC. I was in New York for a few years. So communications was something that I really had to learn on the job because here's the truth. I was not a good communicator. I'm fairly shy. And actually, I'm curious to get my guesses and thoughts. Was she, was she shy? Was she an introvert? Because I certainly was. So it was really hard for me to figure out how do I speak up? How do I speak confidently? So we're going to be talking about that as well today. So without further ado, let's get started with today's event. So I'm very excited to invite my guest, Simone, up. She is, where do I even start? She is an upcoming author. She is a keynote speaker. And she is just doing some amazing work out there, helping people feel empowered. But you know what? I'm going to have Simone do the introduction herself. So let me bring her up here so you all can meet her. Hi, Simone. Hi. I love that. You know, two former TV hosts, uh, very very used to doing introductions for other people, but never for themselves. It's kind of, it's a bit weird, isn't it? <laughs> it's totally weird. Like, and it's funny because, you know, I often talk about elevator pitches too. And it's like, we kind of have to get good at it. But Simone, tell us a little bit about you and the work that you're doing today. Well, firstly, I want to jump in on the part where you are, you were saying, was I always a confident speaker? So as Jess mentioned, we were both former broadcasters. And what was interesting was that I kind of came out of the womb being able to communicate. However, one experience over the course of four years at a broadcasting company in Singapore um, from 2015 to 2019 was the first time in my life I experienced not being able to speak up being intimidated in meetings, being scared and really losing my voice. And it's only after I went through that that I was able to have empathy and create a system to get my voice back, which is what I try um, and share in the work that I do. So I am an author. My book is coming out in the, the state or globally June 27th. And mostly I work with organizations sharing the techniques that authentically bring us together. So the world is in a loneliness epidemic and it's kind of my mission to remind people of these innate human connection skills that we were born with as early humans that we've sort of forgotten along the way. And with AI, that's even further under threat. Obviously with the pandemic, it was under threat. So 
every year there's a new connection issue <laughs> which gets which gets me riled up and keeps the research and the work that I do really um, exciting and fresh. So that's what I do. I love it. And it's funny because loneliness is something I feel many of us probably experience from time to time, whether it's workplace loneliness, personal loneliness, or just kind of just being in our head, perhaps a bit too much, right? So Simone, how did you even think about this being something that you wanted to talk about? Was there some sort of experience that happened that got you motivated to talk about it? Yeah, so I actually, in writing the book, realized that this is a thread, the search for belonging. Look, obviously, Jess and I are both immigrant, Asian immigrant kids. Shout out, today is the last day, at least on my side of the world, of Asian American Pacific Islander Heritage Month. Woo! So we got in there just before the end. But there's a certain set of um, feelings of loneliness when you're a child and you grow up in an environment where you're different from everyone else. I grew up in a very Caucasian part of Australia in the 90s. Oh, honey. People without the internet were never meaner, never meaner without the internet. So it was the lack of social belonging really began then. But when I first looked at the topic, it was actually triggered by two major factors. One was that workplace I mentioned and the toxicity and feeling um, very much that I lost the tools of connection. So here I was lonely but didn't feel confident in the tools. So then the loneliness became deeper and deeper because I didn't have the tools to get out of it, which I had relied on in that immigrant childhood of mine in any moments prior when I had been living in Switzerland or Dubai where I felt different. I had communication to bring me back into a place of connection. And then all of a sudden I lost that. And then at the same time as that workplace thing was happening, mm -hmm. my mother, who has a very rare degenerative disease, was having issues connecting with me so remembering her own life she'd forgotten that my dad died she's having very severe dementia and at moments we're just forgetting parts of our life together and so everywhere I looked at this point of very deep sadness connection was an issue and I started talking about it kind of on the internet and I had a mentor who was saying to me even at the depths of my worst loneliness that I was really good with people and I was like, brother, if you could see what was happening in my head right now, you would not be saying that. And I realized how many people are walking wounded, how many people are lonely, disconnected, wearing this mask, which we do very well in Asia, we say face, right, but who are hurting inside. And what can I do to bring us all together and make this a conversation that's okay to be had? So that's kind of where it all started. And that was 2018 was probably the rock bottom of that. I'm so curious. And actually, you know, for the audience who are here right now, I would love to get your thoughts on this. Just, and I know we're talking about this feeling of isolation, you know, loneliness. And I had mentioned earlier how this really can span, of course, not just work, it could be personal too. Lee, let us know the chat function if this is something that perhaps you've experienced recently and just, you know, how does that feel for you? We know loneliness is loneliness, but I mean, is there something even more than that? So I kind of want to ask you though, Simone, you know, you mentioned this idea of losing your voice and that's very interesting. I'm sure there's a compelling story behind this, but <laughs> grab your drink of water. <laughs> but you know, long story short, it's interesting because most people feel from the beginning that they don't have a voice and then they learn to have a voice, but you're saying you had a voice and then you lost it. Okay. What, how did that happen? It's a really fascinating story. So I'll, I will tell you that as a child growing up in a very pressurized, um, Singaporean immigrant household, even though I'm mixed, my mother is also from Singapore and people often think I'm half Australian, but I'm not. So I had two really hardcore Singaporean immigrant parents and I remember there was a lot of pressure to get good grades at school. And in order to get those good grades, I had to be very expressive, um, but I'm not confrontational. So people see me with this strength and power, I'm very confident, but I'm actually not good with confrontation at all. And so I would go into school, perform as a public speaker, a debater in drama, whatever, be super expressive with my opinion in, in English class, for example and then come back to the house and have strict obedience and a complete smothering of the voice. So I had kind of this schizophrenic um, code switch in childhood. And I write about this in the book as well. 
And then let's imagine that I then go off and I work in the Middle East and I live in Switzerland. So I get even more empowered. I'm living on my own. Still not confrontational, but confident as a speaker in the way that I could articulate a message. And then I get to Singapore in 2015 and I work for a notoriously toxic broadcaster. But I think, oh, I've worked in the UAE. I've lived in the Middle East alone as a woman. I'll be fine. Oh, brothers and sisters, I was not prepared. I was not prepared. And I remember the rock bottom moment standing at the Singapore International Film Festival, having to introduce Dev Patel. This is in 2016. And he was in town for the festival. And I remember my shoulders rolling in, just reading the palm cards, not even looking up. Like the gift, the gift which I was born with, that came out of the womb with, was on the edge of being completely lost forever because of the bullying within that office, the anti foreigner sentiment. Um, you know, they saw me as being Australian to them. So I had now got the reverse racism, if you like, that I had received in my childhood. I now had it from the other way. And I remember walking off stage so disappointed in myself. How many of you in the chat have felt you envisioned doing a speech at work or presentation and you walk off out of that boardroom or off that stage so disappointed in yourself that it didn't come anywhere near what you'd envisioned. And that was the first time in my life at 30, I think I was 33 years old, that I had ever experienced feeling disappointed in speaking. I had always been able to speak. It was the gift God, the universe gave me. And I remember sitting down in my flat thinking, this is my hang. Do you let these people take you forever? Do you devise a plan to get this gift back? Because we're right on the edge here. The shame I felt like I had talent managers from the organization in the audience. I had bitchy co-workers from the organization, that audience. I will never forget that for as long as I live. And then I put a system together. I started reading a lot of communications books, taking courses, but putting a system together to get it back. Because everyone I'd ever heard speaking about this online were people who were introverts like you Jess or they were not confident speakers and then they worked out how to do it I had never had to learn the how you know it was innate to me um and I felt very lonely in this because no one else was speaking about losing it and getting back getting it back I was alone in that experience but I did not let them win it's no big confidence than, uh, than being able to get get that back and then being able to get it back to a level where I can surpass what it was before. So that's why when Jess shares her tips and her, her membership and, and I share communication connection tips, why it's so firstly important that we give that information away for free. I don't want anyone to ever suffer like I suffered that night in my heart. Like I don't want okay. anyone to ever feel that helpless and alone. So that's really powerful, number one. And I think number two, learning a methodology for anything will trump innate skill any day. That's what I learned. Just because, you know, and when you go up in Australia, there's always this thing about innate talent and like, just wing it, just wing it. Don't prepare, just do it off the top of your head. This is what I grew up with. Never did I see more profoundly. You can have innate ability in something, but somebody who can study that can just support you go so crazily with their diligence. I apply that to all areas of my life, like in therapy, uh, any other skill I take on now, like I'm going to just study this. Even if I was born with it, I'm going to study it. So okay. That's my mic drop. That's my TED talk over. <laughs> you said so many things that I feel for a lot of folks, it's interesting because people would think that, you know what? As long as I learn how to be a good communicator, I will always be able to confidently communicate. But I feel like what you're saying is, even though you, for example, you're saying that you knew how to be a good communicator, because of the workplace bullying, the aggression, like let's not even call them microaggressions, but the aggression that you experience in the workplace, the toxic environment, even though you were a good communicator, because of all those influences that affected you, your mind, your heart, your well-being, suddenly it's like all those skills just go out the door, which I feel like this goes into something that's really important. Communications is really a holistic thing. 
And I feel like we probably don't think about it in that way too much, right? But communications isn't just learning how to do like, yeah, speak clearly, speak confidently, know how to get your point across, but it's also up here, right? It's knowing how to not let the haters, the people who criticize you affect the way you do communicate your message. I don't know, Simone, have you, like, is that something that you felt has really landed for you? Yeah, so the best way I would love to explain this to everyone, I always say there's two parts to communication, right? There's, um, I want you to imagine it's like a capsule, you know, when you go to the doctor and or you get a cold and flu capsule. That silky, um, colorful exterior of the capsule that helps us to swallow more easily, that's the execution. That's when Jess teaches you how to project or I teach you on TikTok not to say um and ah and that's that. But the medicine inside that powder that's inside that capsule that's the message and a great communicator has both therefore people can swallow and ingest the message with greater ease that's why when you see a barack obama on stage it's seamless between his verbals his non-verbals they're all one your message is what my message was what was under attack in that office okay so it wasn't so much my execution i still had to go on air on radio every day and do talk breaks but i was talking about absolutely nothing and at that time i was grateful that i was talking about britney spears or ja rule or whatever i was talking about i was happy that i was because i felt so broken inside i could hide behind the vacuousness of the non-message uh, but every day that that got worse my ability to speak up for example off air in meetings was also under attack, which is also the powder. So you're sitting in a meeting and you're being asked a question and the nerves um, and my fear and intimidation from these people was so high that I couldn't even answer. Like I couldn't even answer. So I completely did not have any of my own internal message or opinion. So communication is both of those things. And if you don't have both, if somebody attacks the execution or attacks the message, you're under threat either way. So you need to have the holistic techniques, which Jess teaches, like things to manage that stage fright, that intimidation, as well as you need to have the tools to project your voice and, and stop arming and arming and all those other things. It, it works. Um, there's always two conversations going on when you see a speaker. It's the conversation of the message and then it's the conversation of the execution. There's always two conversations. It's so true. And I love that we're having this conversation because I feel like we are inviting our audience to understand because you and I, I mean, we speak for a living. Like you and I are speaking every single day to different companies, to different organizations, right? And uh, it's very rare that I feel like speakers talk about their process as well. And I think this is so insightful, hopefully for those watching. By the way, if you have any questions, let us know about you know, the speaker and just like how, how do you even get there? But I will tell you, and you know, I actually just did a whole talk yesterday, actually, about presentations with folks. And I always start it off, though, by talking about mindset, because I really don't feel you can teach someone to be a good communicator until you talk about how they can get into the right mindset. And just from a high level, right? It's like, oftentimes, when people think about public speaking, what happens? They get nervous, and they get nervous because they feel people are judging them. They feel like they lose their train of thought. By the way, let us know in the chat function, what happens to you when you get those public speaking nerves? Let us know, are you feeling nervous, sweaty palms, or whatever it is, right? And I always tell folks, first of all, I used to feel this way too. I would get kind of like that sweaty palms, the heart palpitations when I would get really, really nervous. But I always tell folks, actually, the more you do it, the easier it actually gets. Sometimes though, I will still get nervous when I'm public speaking, and that's because the environment changes, uh, the people changes. So you kind of have to be very adaptable. But Simone, I'm curious, what are some like public speaking tricks? I feel like everybody would love to know from your point of view. Yeah. I, so one that I love that addresses specifically mindset is I have like a confidence playlist and I um, was speaking yesterday at KPMG and they didn't have a holding room. So just to explain, when Jess and I go do a, a corporate keynote at a Fortune 100, Fortune 500, a lot of the time they do have a, like a back room where you can be to get in the zone, but also to give the speaking engagement a sense of occasion so that when you're introduced by the MC and you walk out, 
the audience hasn't already seen you milling around, but that's not always the case. As Jess says, we can't control the environment, we can only control us. So one thing that I do do, which I guess can seem quite contradictory to some people because I'm the human connection girl, but I do put the headphones in and I do try and find, regardless of the office, a very quiet area five minutes before the speech to listen to my confidence playlist. These are songs which either are nostalgic and remind me of a moment in my life where I felt specifically happy and powerful, or they're recent songs that just light me up. They lift that energy. And I will go into that zone specifically five minutes before. A huge mistake that a lot of novice speakers make is they run their lines or their presentation right up until the, the, the minute before. When you do that, you're actually telling the subconscious mind that you don't know it well enough. So you're sending that message to the subconscious. I don't know my speech well enough and I'm freaking out. We're just going to make you freak, freak out even more. So my big suggestion here is absolutely um, use the happy playlist. When you get off this event with Jess and I, I want you to note down on a piece of paper, what are the five songs that absolutely make you feel like For a lot of people, this will be the music as a former radio DJ. This will be the music that they heard in the year they turned 18 or in America, maybe 21. This was the year where you could first go clubbing, maybe had your first drink, first other experiences, start driving. And a lot of the music from that time in your life will be a big prompt. That really helps to address a lot of mindset fears because it, it innately, you get a music video in your mind of you in the time where you melt, felt most empowered. And remember that your brain doesn't distinguish between the visualization and what is actually happening. So if you feel vulnerable and you want to feel like the most powerful version of you, put those songs on. Oh, Muhammad says, I will survive by Gloria Gaynor. Hell yes. <laughs> I know. I was just reading that. And I was like, let us know in the chat function, what is your, your hype song or your confidence playlist, right? I was actually just thinking, what would be my hype song? And I'm thinking, I don't know, maybe some sort of like Beyonce song, right? Like <laughs> women power. <Not> <laughs> Girl, who runs the world, girls. Um, he's saying American rap music, yes. I once interviewed Lewis Hamilton, the F1 driver, and I asked him what his song was before race day. And he said, um, I can't say N-word in Paris by Kanye. And that's like a hardcore, hyper-masculine, aggressive song. So I understand why an athlete would listen to that. I tend to listen to the bring warmth. So because... Because I'm just looking at all the comments that are coming in. And, you know, it kind of reminds me. So it's basketball season here in the States right now. And a lot of times you'll actually see the basketball players before they even start playing. Why do they have these big headphones on? They're probably listening to their hype music as well, right? So when we are about to get up and present, what are you going to be listening like the basketball players that you see on TV? I feel like every great performer, every great athlete, they're doing the exact same thing too. I love all the comments coming in. <laughs> okay. Absolutely. And as we always say like 90% of your presentation is happening in the preparation before you get on, you know, you even get on the stage. And what I did yesterday was I actually acknowledged me with the headphones sitting in the corner in there, in the context of what I was teaching so that they knew why I was doing it. it wasn't that I didn't want to connect with them. It was just it allowed me to serve them better once the game had started. And people are very forgiving in that way if you explain to them. Sorry, sorry to inter bad communication. Sorry to have interrupted you, Jess. There's a lag and I jumped in. Oh, no worries. Yeah, I know there's a bit of a lag, but hopefully it's okay for everybody who's watching right now. So I actually wanted to share uh, two of my favorite tips when it comes to presentation mindset. And this really goes back to what people taught me when I first started out as a broadcaster, right? It's always treated as a conversation, right? I think sometimes we can get so hyper-focused on we are speaking to this group of people, all these executives, but at the end of the day, we have to humanize the experience. So number one, treat it like a conversation. The second tip that I will always remember, and I remember to this day right now, is don't think of it that you're speaking to an executive. Think about that you're speaking to Simone, to Jessica. Think about you're talking to your family or your friends. You know, I feel like 
that reminder takes so much pressure off the need to have to impress. Whenever we feel like we have to impress our audience, that's your mind is not in the right place when it comes to speaking. When you're speaking, what you're doing is, and Simone, you'll like this, whenever you're speaking, you're connecting. You're trying to engage. And if all you can think about is, am I using too many filler words? Am I making sense? You're missing that opportunity to connect with your audience. Is that similar to what you're thinking too? Yeah, that's exactly the video I posted on Instagram last night. I'm going to post it on LinkedIn after this. But it's actually about um, when I when I first started speaking. And a lot of women who are watching are going to resonate with this. I used to wear like the Fox News presented body con dresses when I first started speaking because I thought that's what a attractive corporate female speaker should wear. Where I got that idea, I don't know. Um, and I remember doing a gig at the Singapore Expo, a very large stage. So you're, it's different from an intimate room where you can connect as well. You're, you're quite kind of like a poly pocket with, with like two and a half thousand, three thousand people. And I remember sucking it in, being conscious about how the photos would turn out. They turned out terrible, by the way. Um, and I, I remember that was the moment that I decided to wear suits when I speak. And it's now become a personal branding thing and lots of other girls copied it and are doing it or whatever. But it literally came about because I thought wearing these dresses is making you a less good speaker because you are thinking about yourself. You are self-conscious about how you look on stage. And the minute you do that, you stop serving and connecting with your audience. And then you've lost the game, honey. You're not getting rebooked. You're not making people feel your message. You're about you and your ego. So get that shiz out of the way. So I've started buying all these baggy oversized suits. It's like wearing pajamas on stage. I let it all hang out. But I connect so much better. And then I think, why not? Because the male speakers all wear suits as well. So why not us? Um, if you want to check out that video, it's on my Instagram at Simone Hank. It's very funny as well. Um, but that's another example of how the logistics of what you might do. So maybe you wear uncomfortable shoes that tip your body weight over. Or for men, sometimes men will wear a suit that's very tight that mm. they haven't tried on because uh, there was a pandemic and they gained weight. They didn't know. And then all of a sudden the buttons are opening. I've had executives in media training that like the buttons are opening around the stomach. Of course, you're not going to be able to connect with your audience when you're worried that your button's going to pop out in their eye. You know, like we, these things are all things that can um, hinder the mindset. So we want to think very holistically about serving the audience and connecting and less about ourselves. So there's one question that I saw in the audience that I wanted to get to because it's a really good one. And it has to do with folks who consider themselves multicultural and they they perhaps work in a cross-cultural environment. I mean, hey, we have an international audience right now, so I imagine that might be the case. So this question specifically is asking, how do folks who might be a bit more introverted succeed in an extroverted world? I have so many thoughts on this, but Simone, I want to get your thoughts and I'll share my thoughts on, you know, because I have a lot of stories too. So Simone, how does somebody who maybe tends to be a bit more quiet, how can they get their voice heard if their team, the people they're working with are just very, very loud? Okay. Well, how about we do this, Jess? I'm going to answer this from the human connection point of view and you can answer from the communications point of view because I want to learn from you on this. But I can tell you from what I know about introversion, extroversion from the human connection and science, right? So what we know is that all human beings on a differing spectrum need human connection. It's why to us as an evolutionary basic human need. So I get a lot of kids on TikTok are like, I'm an introvert, even if they're not like diagnosed as true introverts. Like, I'm an introvert. I don't need human connection. We all do need it to soothe our own fight or flight response. We need a sense of belonging and connection. So that's number one. Number two, introverts, you can do things to um, make it easy for you to break through a crowd and first connect with people. So number one, you see that I'm very bling blingy when I, when I do speaking engagements or I go out. But actually, if you saw me around the house and when I travel, I just wear black on black all the time. If you're an introvert, Try and wear something that's a bit attention grabbing. That way, more extroverted people will approach you. 
in a social setting and they will be like, nice earrings. They will start the conversation for you so you don't have to approach. And when you go to socialization events that you have to maybe attend for work and it, it's very draining for you, try and ask a more extroverted friend to go along with you. They will draw people in so that you can then enter conversation without you having to do an initial approach. And one exercise that I really love, and this goes for particularly introverts communicating on digital means, give me an emoji um, in the chat if you are doing hybrid communication right now and you're using video. So the camera, Jess and I both know from having worked in media for a long time, kind of dilutes 30% of your beautiful natural energy. So if you're introverted, you can come across almost disinterested, which can be absolutely life-changing in a bad way on a high scale with a leader running business from you look like you're interested because you're kind of low energy even though you might just be relating in the way you would normally before you get on the session online i want you to do some priming so i want you to imagine you're about to do the activity that you love the most in the entire world. So this could be, for me, what I really love is a business class flight paid for by a client where I have no one contacting me and I can watch movie marathon and get fed by the air stewardess like a giant baby, <laughs> like right? And that is my, um, my really zone out time. And I get very excited about that. So I would channel that, that lifts that energy engages the Duchenne smile, which is the smile we connect with, where we crinkle in the corner of our eyes, which conveys to the person we want to connect with that we um, are being sincere. And it just lifts your energy in a way that you'll mitigate for that 30%. So as an introvert, you come across as you're still engaged and interested on on virtual means. And it's quite important because introverts really suffer when on video in this way they'll avert eye contact because they feel they're really being stared at just get that mindset right so that you can give all of those um that great energy if i tell most clients lift your energy they will speak faster and louder that's going to freak out hey introvert that's going to freak out the person you're connecting with so do this activity which will lift the energy from inside to be heightened rather than speaking louder or faster. So that would be my three tips for introverts for connection. Okay, so you said something really relevant in terms of hybrid communications because you're right. Anytime we are, and by the way, I, I imagine many of us might still be on Zoom meetings, team meetings, right, having client meetings online. It is so much harder for introverts to get their voice heard in this type of setting because it's so much easier to hide as well, right? And so even if you feel like you're being very emotive in your gestures, it actually doesn't translate that much on video, 100%. So in terms of like my communication tips, and I love this question about an introverted person trying to succeed in an extroverted world, because that is actually very much about this book that I'm writing. That's the premise. It's like, how can we find that voice when everybody else is so loud and so dominating? So my whole thing is teaching people more strategic ways to get their voice heard. If just speaking up, right? Just because, you know, sometimes people are like, well, you can't just say speak up and I will speak up. Like that's just not how it works, right? You have to kind of get into that mindset. So it's like, how can we be a bit more strategic? I mean, I will say in relation to our talk today, making those one-on-one -on -one connections, that is a way to rise up. At the end of the day, Finding those people in your office, on your team, who have a bit of social capital, how can you build that relationship with them? Because those are the people, perhaps extroverted people, they are the ones that may think of you when you're not in the room. Your name may come up even though you're not in the room, but because somebody endorses you, right? So it's like finding those people who have that social capital to pull you up even though you may not have that loud, booming voice. I feel like that's a very strategic way to go about work because, Simone, you and I know it's not just about working hard. Working hard is status quo. Working hard is expected. But if you're talking about your career brand and why people know you, what are you known for, that ultimately comes down to who are you surrounded by and who can endorse you. A lot of that has to do with communications. 
So, um, absolutely. Who who was who will advocate for you as an introvert within the office? And I'm 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 that loud person in the office who, when I was in radio, would advocate for um, my best girlfriend in Dubai. I'm now the godmother of her child, so I must have advocated pretty well. <laughs> All right. So here's another question that I'm just reading right now. Apologies. I'm actually reading as I'm talking too. So this one is when in team leadership positions and in general team meetings, what are some strategies to support and advocate for international and foreign and foreign colleagues so they can be more engaged and there is equal communication opportunities? First of all, that is a good, good question. And for us in Singapore, huge issue for us. Do you want to go first or should I go first? You I have to go, sweetheart. Okay. Sorry. Sorry for interjecting. Yeah. So, okay. I feel like, and there's two parts to this question. If you are in a manager position, I feel it is so critical for you to take that proactive effort in making sure that everybody does have that same opportunity to voice their opinions. And as a manager, it is up to us to give everybody that equal opportunity. So, okay, let's just be real. When we are in a Zoom setting, for example, and there are many people in here, and let's say you're the manager, you're organizing this, you have to kind of take that moderator role. And I don't know, Simone, this might resonate with you, but you're almost like you're a moderator, right? You have to like look around. Who's kind of on the quiet side right now? Who hasn't chimed in for a while? And give them that opportunity to speak and say, hey, Simone, I know you probably have some thoughts on this. In fact, I remember last week you were just talking to me about this. So you're paving the way for people to actually contribute because I know for a fact the more introverted people, they always have a hard time figuring out when. When do I chime in, <laughs> right? So as a manager, I feel like we can all pave that way for the more quiet folks to be more engaged. In fact, I do this all the time in my meetings right now. If I have a lot of folks, I'm not just talking. I'm looking. I'm looking at who, who looks a bit disengaged and then how can I engage them? I'm always thinking about this. Okay, Simone, what are some of your thoughts on how to engage people? Firstly, I want to just deep dive. Thank you, Akul, for raising this. It's probably one of the most um, common issues in uh, Asia Pacific, uh, in ASEAN, because you have the Aussies and Kiwis on the team being more vocal than the Southeast Asian counterparts. Um, and this is not me saying this. This is what organisations have come to me to talk to me about and then bring me in as someone who lives between those two worlds, who knows how to code switch between both of those forms of communication. So I just want to acknowledge that this is a huge issue. And um, I think one of the things particularly, um, if what happens if you don't have a manager who's mindful, right? So one of the things that has come up in the last three years wonderfully is a diversity and inclusion movement. So there, there's much more inclusivity than there was when I first started this work in 2019, for example, but it's still a huge problem. I think it's also looking um, to make sure that you as the dominant one are not being too dominant. This is an issue that I had when I first started broadcasting in a very liberal environment. When I worked for Virgin Radio in Dubai, it was really like the Virgin brand, a very creative environment. Everyone was empowered to speak because we knew the more opinions, the better creativity, right? But it got to a point where you're in a room full of dominant people and maybe only one or two are introverts. And I wasn't emotionally mature enough at that age to be looking for my introverted colleague. I wasn't looking out for them. And so what a wonderful blessing it was to be bullied, really, in that last workplace and to then become the introverted colleague and to see it from the other point of view. So if you are a domineering person, you, it is your job in the workplace to look at your colleagues who speak English as a second language, which means they are translating in their head to join that communal language. It is your job to take a step back sometimes and create that space for other people. That's the mark of a good leader is to not just think about the self, but think about others. And, you know, I will say, even though you may be the manager, Imagine if you had a manager that was so mindful of the team, you are going to be seeing praises of that manager. And I feel like people know who are the good managers, right? We also know who are the bad managers. I'm sure some of us can think about 
the bad managers because they've really kind of just seared themselves in our memory. So you don't want to be that bad manager. And I will say, if you are a good manager, people hear it, your name gets repeated. And again, that's how the better and bigger opportunities come about. So one of the things I want to say, I, I'm, by the way, we've been chatting for over 45 years. I love hanging out with you. It never feels like any sort of, I mean, is there even an audience right now? I know that you're there, but I just love Jess so much. It's, and isn't she so beautiful? Like, I know this is LinkedIn, but I can never get over how little makeup Jess wears and how absolutely beautiful she is. So let me just throw that in. Um, sorry, sorry. Yes, as you're saying. No, that's so funny. I mean, speaking of makeup, for any of our ladies who are here, I feel like I used to cake on the makeup when I was on TV. And now that I, I can kind of control it a little bit more, I'm just more like, you know why? It's just too much work. So honestly, for you, Simone, if you can do it, kudos to you. I'm just jealous. I love it because I'm schlepping around the house writing most of the time now in like literally Uniqlo tracksuit pants. So uh, under the table, there's still Uniqlo tracksuit. So I like it because I, I, it's, I feel like I'm still engaged in life a little bit. This is <laughs> the, opposite, the opposite problem. No, I'm, hey, I'm wearing sweats underneath here too. And that's the beauty. <laughs> that's the beauty of doing these virtual events, working really? hybrid. You know what? I actually, it reminds me when I did my executive, so I'm also a LinkedIn learning instructor for those who don't know. And my first LinkedIn learning course that I did, which by the way, has over a million views now. It's called Developing Executive Presence on Video. I have a whole section on wardrobe and I actually say, you should wear PJs on the bottom if you're working from home. You should wear your yoga pants. You should wear sweats. Be comfortable. That's my thing. <laughs> a thousand percent, a thousand percent. Um, Jess, should I quickly answer Mubina's question before just to make sure the extroverts get their time as well on this? Yes, yes, yes. Please, please do. So Mubina asks, any tips for extroverts to calm down? Oh, yeah. You bit, are you a bit excitable like me, Mubina? Um, when I was on radio and I was really young, I was like 24 years old, I actually went out one night the night before and was a little bit hungover the next day. Like, and I was very sick while I was on air and I had a very competitive colleague who was off air, but wanted to get on air. And she actually went to tell my boss like, oh, Simone is hungover and she's, you know, she's not on form. And he said to her and later on told me, because he, he's one of those incredible managers that does not tolerate any of that kind of political stuff. And he said to her, oh, that's really funny. I actually thought she sounded really good today. She was a bit more calm. So that's too, so that's not a suggested way for you to be more um, calm, Mubina, but I thought that was a cute story that would make you smile. Um, I think a wonderful way is for all highly hyperactive people or very extroverted people, you'll get an incredibly nervous energy before you go do something that, that gives you a fight or flight response, a job interview, a speech, for example. And because your energy is already so big, the whole room is going to feel it you find as an extrovert, your audience will really mirror you because your energy is so big. So even those tweaks of nervousness that, so my big tip for highly extroverted people is you've got to learn breath work. And so shall we do one quick, a little quick one together, Jess, to Ooh. give everyone an amazing tool they can put in their pocket when they leave this event and take with them everywhere. Let's it's changed it. my life. It's called 448 Breathing. And if you do this for two minutes, similar to the power poses, for example, if you do this for two minutes, it will get the vagus nerve to trigger the prefrontal cortex to drop five happy hormones into the blood, one of which is melatonin, um, Mubina, which is what helps us sleep, right? So it, it just brings us down a bit. So we're going to breathe in for four seconds through the nose, hold it for four seconds in, the in, in our mouth, and then breathe out for eight. So this is what it looks like, okay? Breathe in three, four, hold it, three, four, out through the mouth, six, seven, eight. And you just repeat this for one and a half to two minutes as an extrovert if you just want to take that nervous energy down a bit um, and it's just going to help you chill out. It's like, you know, when you're too much and like your introverted friends are like, can you just bring it down? Um, but, it, but it's important because if you're, 
nervous in a bad way, like almost a bit agitated. As an extrovert, your audience will pick it up immediately because your energy is big. They will mirror that. So they will be agitated because you're agitated and we don't want that. You know, that breathing exercise is so fantastic because I often think, so I have, I have this habit where I go through this long mental download right before I sleep at night. So when I'm laying in bed, I usually will think about everything that happened, the conversations I have, have had, the things I have to do tomorrow and this week. And it's truly like I'm processing in my mind, like literally downloading. And oftentimes when I do that, I start feeling anxious because it's like this quiet time, but now I'm thinking about so many things. And then I suddenly, I can't sleep anymore. So this breathing exercise of breathe in four, hold four, and then breathe out eight, I feel like it helps me calm down because that mental download at night, it can really just stay. So, yeah. And as introverts, that's also your world, right? Your world is all here. It's all happening in, in the mind. And that works for you as well. I love that this commenter has just said, as an introvert, extreme extroverts remind me of a large puffy puppy huffing its breath in my face. I don't dislike that, but it can be a lot to handle. Yeah. Oh my gosh. I love that. That's funny. Okay. All right. Simone, I know we have to wrap up here, which is so sad because I'm just having so much fun just chatting with you. And I hopefully all the audience member, you know, you're kind of getting a sneak peek on just kind of us having this conversation, but it's really about communications and human connection. So I guess one of my last questions for you, as we kind of start to wrap up here, I always like to ask my guests, if there was any sort of golden nugget that you would want our guests to walk away with in regards to human connection, powerful communications, what would that be? What would you want them to remember? To be others driven in a self-driven world. If whenever you're in doubt about any interaction, just remember if you can just be others driven first, it's very difficult for it to go wrong. The worst mistakes I've ever made in connecting with people in my life were not empathizing with them and thinking about their needs. And if we could live in a world where everyone did that a little bit more, I think we would all come together pretty quickly. One of my last tips, and when it comes to human connection, you know, I feel like early on in my career, I never prioritized really trying to connect with other people in that professional way. I, I was always of this mentality of, it's just me, like I just have to succeed, like it's just me alone. and. It's funny because the longer you work, the more you realize how important it is the people you know, because those are the people who are going to support you, who are going to cheer for you. So really surrounding yourself, you know, for those who are watching, who can you surround yourself with at work that can really be on your side? And you know what? There are going to be some people who you just don't click with. That is okay. That is okay. But there will be plenty of other people at work right now who you may or may not know who you're going to be like, I really like this person. And those are the people who you both together will rise up. So I feel like when all of us are often just so consumed into the day-to-day -day work, the day-to-day -day grind, right, our long to-do list, that sometimes we, for we can forget that we have to prioritize that human connection. I'm sure, Simone, you know, there's probably tons of studies that human connections can prevent burnout, right? You know, we're talking about loneliness. But at the end of the day, if you have somebody who you can turn to, a confidant, an ally at work, you know, I kind of just think about, Back when I was working, I, I used to have this great manager who he never he never made me feel that I couldn't share my own thoughts, right? And it's like that made me so happy to come to work every day. I mean, work sometimes is just work, but knowing that you have people there, I feel like it can change everything. So absolutely. Lots more of that in the book. Um, you can go to let's talk about loneliness.com. And right now we are on pre-order. So I actually give away an annual membership to my public speaking school. I give away um, a downloadable audio exactly on what Jess talked about, burnout and human connection. There's a downloadable audio on human connection resilience, as well as a little mini ebook on navigating difficult conversations. So if any of that resonates, please, for the price of uh, a pre-order of a book, you can get all of that. 
please check out Simone's book. We are celebrating her her pre-launch right now because her book is coming out, and honestly, in just like a, sh a few short weeks. So, you know, we're it's a lot of what we're talking about today. And honestly, as a upcoming author, you're wait, you're about a year ahead of me right now, Simone. But as I can't even imagine how exciting and also nerve wracking it must feel right now. So. Please go support her and her book. Now, in terms of some logistics here, so again, we are so happy that you attended our event today. I will let you know we have another event coming up. It's actually going to be next week, and that is with Gemma, and she is an emotional intelligence expert. She's also a fellow LinkedIn learning instructor. I think her courses have over 2 million views on emotional intelligence. So her and I are going to be on here again, and we're going to be talking about how we can cultivate it as well as resilience. It's another topic that I love talking about. And of course, we're going to link it to communications. I'll post the link to RSVP for that event in the chat function. One other thing, we also, in speaking of memberships, we also have a membership here at Soulcast Media, and we are actually going to be closing doors on the enrollment for that membership next week. And one of the reasons why is because we're going to be doing a whole rehaul. So actually, that will also change the price of this membership. So actually, if you can get in now for this last enrollment period, this is a chance um, I teach you communication skills every month. It's called the Soulcast Media Membership. So you can go online. You can look it up on our website, soulcastmedia.com. But highly encourage you to also check out that. Again, Simone, where can people follow you if they don't already? Yeah, um, LinkedIn, of course, or Instagram at Simone Heng. Um, and there's lots of links in my Instagram bio as well about, you know, freebies that you can get and all the good stuff. But I'm very, very active on both LinkedIn and Instagram. Thank you, Jess. Of course. Please follow her if you don't already. And again, we appreciate you all for staying and we loved hearing your comments. If you have any other questions that Simone and I did not get to, feel free to message us and we'll try to reach and we'll, we'll try to answer it. So again, Simone, thank you so much for your time and thank you everybody for joining us today. Take care.